Suffer little children to come unto me. It states on the memorial monument only a few yards away from where Michael and Alexander lost their lives. As this tiny southern town goes numbly through the sad practiced motions of burying children, the lake draws people to its haunted shores. They stare hard at the calm water and ask one another how this could have happened and why. A single rose floats over the water where Susan Smith released the emergency brake on her car that night in 1994. Welcome to the Red X Crime Files. This is the case of Susan Smith. During her trial, Susan Smith, defense psychiatrist, diagnosed her with dependent personality disorder. The youngest of three children and only girl led an emotionally tortured and tumultuous life. Her father Harry, whom she adored, committed suicide when she was only six years old. Clinging on to memories, she kept her father's coin collection and an audio recording so she would not forget his voice. When her mother Linda married Barry Russell, a thriving stockbroker, things seemed to be looking bright for the family's future. At the local Winn-Dixie grocery store where she worked, Smith had sexual relationships with two co-workers. One of them was David Smith. David was initially engaged with another woman, but started dating Susan and broke off the engagement. Susan and David got married on March the 15th, 1991. Susan was already two months pregnant at the time. Shortly after the wedding, David and his parents were suffering from the loss of another son and brother who had died from Crohn's disease. Overwhelmed by grief, David's father attempted suicide and his mother moved to another city. This sort of family drama was entirely consistent with what Susan was used to. She and David spent the first month of their marriage comforting each other. On October the 10th, 1991, their first son Michael was born. Susan and David lavished love and attention on him, but the pressure of child-rearing and stark differences in the personalities and backgrounds of the parents began to take their toll. Susan would constantly turn to her mother, Linda, for financial support and advice. David found Linda intrusive, controlling, and he did not like her input, especially when it came to raising Michael. A few months later, the pair separated, although they made several attempts to save their marriage over the next month. Susan started dating an ex-boyfriend from work at that time, which only complicated things. In December 1992, Susan announced to David that she was pregnant again. Alexander Smith, the second son, came into the world on August 5, 1993. In September, the marriage separated again. All hopes for a reunion failed when David started a new relationship with a co-worker. In December 1992, Susan announced to David that she was pregnant again. Alexander Tyler, the second son, came into the world on August 5th, 1993. And him and Susan had hoped another child would save their marriage and they borrowed money from Susan's mom for a down payment on a house, but it did not work out. They were too different. No longer wanting to work in the same place as her husband at the Win dixie store, Susan found a new job as a bookkeeper at Console Products, a textile company and largest employer in Union. Susan was promoted quickly and became the executive secretary for Console's president and CEO, J. Carey Findlay. Her new job elevated Susan socially, exposing her to wealthy people and their extravagant lifestyles. Susan fell in love with Tom Findlay, a 27-year-old designer who, in addition to working with her, was the son of her boss by January 1994. It was what she had been looking for from the beginning. As soon as she saw him, she was bowled over. Tom was one of the most handsome bachelors in Union. They soon started dating. David tried to reconcile, but Susan rejected him and instead chose to ask him for a divorce. 
That was the first step to fulfill her dream. She envisioned a beautiful home, a lovely family, and a happy life, always with Tom by her side. Unfortunately, he did not want the same. In fact, he was about to end the relationship. Days before Susan and David's divorce papers were filed in October, Tom Findlay wrote Susan a letter. Among other things, he wrote, You will, without a doubt, make some lucky man a great wife, but unfortunately, it won't be me. If you want to catch a nice guy like me one day, you have to act like a nice girl. And you know, nice girls don't sleep with married men. Tom referenced to an incident at a party at his father's house when Susan openly engaged in sexual foreplay with a married man in a hot tub. The letter further states, Susan, I could really fall for you. You have so many endearing qualities about you, and I think that you are a terrific person. But like I have told you before, there are some things about you that aren't suited for me, and yes, I am speaking about your children. I'm sure that your kids are good kids, but it really wouldn't matter how good they may be. The fact is, I just don't want children. These feelings may change one day, but I doubt it. With all the crazy mixed up things that take place in this world today, I just don't have the desire to bring another life into it. And I don't want to be responsible for anyone else's children either. But I am very thankful that there are people like you who are not so selfish as I am, and don't mind bearing the responsibility of children. If everyone thought the way that I do, our species would eventually become extinct. But our differences go far beyond the children's issues. We are just two totally different people, and eventually those differences would cause us to break up. Because I know myself so well, I'm sure of this. His words shocked her. She tried several times to see Tom. She cried, begged him to come back, told him about all the pain she had suffered in her life, but everything she said failed to move him. For him it was over. By October the 25th, 1994, Smith was consumed by thoughts of her breakup with Tom Findlay. At around 2.30 p.m., Susan called Tom in his office and asked him to meet her outside of the building to talk. Susan told Tom that David was threatening to expose some embarrassing information about her in their divorce proceedings. Tom asked her to explain what the information was and Susan told him that David would accuse her of cheating the IRS and of having an affair with his father. After recovering from the shock of hearing about the alleged affair Susan had with his father, Tom told Susan that their friendship would remain intact. Our sexual relationship will have to stop forever. At 4.30 p.m., Susan sought out Tom again at the console photo studio. Susan attempted to return Tom's Auburn University sweatshirt she had borrowed, but Tom refused to accept it and told Susan to hold on to it. After collecting her sons at daycare, Susan headed in her car to Hickory Nuts. While she was driving there, she spotted Sue Brown, the marketing manager at console, in her car. Both Sue and Susan pulled into the Hickory Nuts parking lot. She expressed her fears over Tom's reaction to her sleeping with his father. She couldn't give up the idea of swaying Tom's feelings. She asked her friend to watch the children while she went to Tom's office to admit to him that the story was a lie. According to Sue, Tom was not happy at all to see Susan and quickly escorted her out of his office. Later in the evening, Sue Brown was eating dinner at Hickory Nuts with several friends, including Tom Findlay. During the meal, a waiter brought a cordless telephone to Sue. On the line was Susan Smith, calling to ask Sue if Tom Findlay had asked about her. Sue told her that he had not. At around 8 p.m., Susan dressed her sons, placed them in their car seats in her car, and began driving around Union. She drove along Highway 49 and followed the signs to John D. Long Lake. Susan had never been to this lake in the past. Once she arrived at the shore of the lake, Susan drove across a portion of the 75-foot boat ramp 
and parked in the middle of the ramp. The ramp was unpaved and consisted only of gravel and stones. Susan sat quietly behind the wheel of her 1990 Burgundy Mazda, listening to the sounds of her two young sons sleeping. Michael, her oldest son, had celebrated his third birthday only two weeks earlier, and Alex was just 14 months old. Susan shifted the Mazda into neutral and felt the car slowly begin to roll down the remaining length of the boat ramp. The car only traveled a few yards before Susan stepped on the brake. With a shift tug, Susan pulled the emergency handbrake, stopping the car from further rolling forward. She opened her door and stepped out of the car. Susan stood outside on the boat ramp on the banks of John D. Long Lake and thought about suicide. She looked around and saw only black. The lake was not illuminated and she stood alone thinking about her life. The darkness of the deserted lake must have mirrored the mindset of Susan that night. She wanted relief from her loneliness and the problems in her life. Susan later stated that she wanted to commit suicide but she did not want her sons to suffer. Susan believed if she killed her sons first and then commit suicide, that her sons would suffer less, rather than if she committed suicide and left them on their own. Yet something was stopping her from surrendering to her depression. She did not want to commit suicide. What she wanted was relief from all the stresses and burdens that overwhelmed her so much. She felt that her life was filled with loss and rejection, and that the responsibilities of being a single mother were just overwhelming. Susan's next decision will never be forgotten. Susan Smith released the emergency brake and softly closed the driver's side door. Michael and Alex were asleep in the back seat, strapped into their car seats. As the car drifted into John D. Long Lake, the headlights were on. The car entered the water slowly and did not submerge immediately. Instead, it remained on the surface, peacefully, while slowly filling with water. Five minutes and 52 seconds passed as Susan Smith calmly watched as the lake swallowed her car with Michael and Alex in it. It was the end for her children, but in her mind a new beginning for herself. She just ran away and felt free. Susan ran to a nearby home and pounded hysterically on the door. Homeowners Shirley and Rick McLeod were the first people to hear the story that would shock a nation. The young woman cried, Please help me! He's got my kids! He's got my car! Shirley led Susan into her home and she told her that a black male had taken her car at gunpoint and disappeared into the night with her two boys. Smith described how she had stopped at the red light at Monarch Mills how the man jumped into her car and told her to drive. She had driven around with the man in a state of absolute terror. She said he told her to stop and get out of the car. The black male said he wouldn't hurt the kids and then drove off with them. She could hear Michael's and Alex's cries as they called out for her. This is the 911 call Rick McCloud placed. Can't even get a figure out which way he's going. What kind remember. of car is it? What we need to know something. We, we're trying to ask her now. A Mazda protege. What color was it? A burgundy Mazda protege. Get him going, Pam. I got two kids. Okay. okay. That's a black guy, she says. Okay. Black male? Yes, ma'am. You know which way? Do you, do you know which way he went? Does she dead? Ask her if she know which way he went towards. Did he have a gun? Ask him, did he have a gun? Okay. Where did he come back? He's trying to get it out of her now. Did he have any weapons, gun, anything? Did he have a... That, look, going towards Chester. Did he have a gun or a weapon in there? He had a gun. Yeah. He's got a gun. He's got a gun. Yes, ma'am. Hello? Okay. okay. I'm on the way. Okay. Uh, uh, give me your name. Me anything? Rick McLeod's my name. Do you need us to tell you anything from our yard or anything? Uh, Okay, can you get a tag number out of her? Did it. Please get a tag number. Is that only house number? Before the police arrived, the McLeod family searched along the road, hoping that the kidnapper had left the children somewhere on the side, but failed to locate the boys. Supported by family and David back at her side, the search for their children intensified. The tragic story of the boys' abduction dominated the news. Susan, 
pled publicly for the safe return of her sons. David, distraught, joined in. But behind the scenes, away from the cameras, people around her began to notice odd and unsettling behavior from a mother whose first and only concern should be her missing children. Smith seemed preoccupied with how she looked in front of the cameras and concerned about the whereabouts of Tom Findlay. She managed to dramatically sob and cry in front of the cameras, but her eyes remained dry and tearless. Susan's story was beginning to fall apart. And then police let me take them and he said no we didn't have time because they were in car seats and it was going to take time for me to get them out of the car seat and um they just told me he said but i won't hurt them and he just took off but he had a gun and then my my big thing is they were screaming hollering and crying and i'm just scared that he just lost his patience or something all for them and that they are being taken care of and that they are safe and that they will return home safely I want to say to my babies <laughs> that your mama loves you so much and your daddies, these whole families love you so much. <laughs> and you guys have got to be strong because you are, we, 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 I just know, I just feel in my heart that you're okay. For nine days, Susan sustained the lie. The lead investigator on this case, Sheriff Howard Wells, asked the smith to take a polygraph, to which they both consented. David passed, but Susan's results were inconclusive. Throughout the nine days of the investigation, Susan was questioned and polygraphed many times. As the time passed, inconsistencies emerged in her carjacking story. What led the investigators to doubt Susan's truthfulness was her claim that she had stopped at a red light on Monarch Mills Road. She said, that at the time the light had turned red, there were no other cars on the road. But investigators knew that it was always green and only turned red if it was triggered by a car on the cross street. Since Smith claimed to have seen no other cars on the road, there was no reason for her to have stopped and that red light was a fabrication. She also claimed to have stopped at Walmart to meet with a friend, but the friend never knew anything about a meeting with Smith. On November the 3rd, 1994, Susan met with Sheriff Wells for another interrogation. After nine fruitless days, Wells was blunt, told her he didn't believe there had been a carjacking nor a kidnapper. Confronted with evidence, exhausted and emotional, after being questioned for several days, Susan finally broke. She asked Wells to pray with her. She expressed how ashamed she felt for what she had done. Detectives stated, that Susan described everything and was able to even remember the smallest details of her gruesome act. She tried to explain that she actually wanted to commit suicide, but had jumped out of the car at the last minute. Having lied so much throughout the search and interviews, no one was listening to her anymore. Nobody believed her anymore. Before publicly announcing the news of Susan's confession, Sheriff Wells wanted to find the bodies of the little boys. Previous searches of the lake had come up empty, but during her confession, Smith revealed the car's exact location in the lake. This was another indicator that Smith stood by, watching as the sons drowned. Divers found the red Mazda turned upside down, with Michael and Alex still in their car seats. One diver saw the small hand of one of the children pressed up against the window. Tom Findlay's letter was also found. The autopsy revealed later that Michael and Alex were alive when the car sunk into the lake. The cause of death was drowning in the manner of death homicide, and reenactment showed how Michael and Alex met their end. The whole world watched in horror. The world now knew that Susan had murdered them in cold blood without the slightest hint of mercy as to not lose her lover. Susan Smith has been arrested and will be charged with two counts of murder in connection with the deaths of her children, Michael, three, and Alexander, 14 months. The vehicle, a 1990 Mazda driven by Smith, 
was located late Thursday afternoon in Lake John D. Long near Union. Two bodies were found in the vehicle's back seat. Identities are pending and all In court, Susan's defense lawyers worked hard to generate sympathy from the jury by emphasizing the tragedy and sexual abuse she had suffered in her childhood. They explained that her abnormal deep dependence on others for happiness led to her unthinkable decision to sacrifice the lives of her children in a desperate bid to retain the attention of Tom. As normal as she may have appeared, Susan Smith was hiding and lived with a deep-seated mental disorder. But the prosecution showed the jury a completely different side of Smith, more devious, more manipulative. In this cold and chilling perspective, her boys were little more than impediments for her emotional gratification. By killing them, she would not only win the sympathy of her former lover Tom, she would also see this as a new start and was hoping for a reunion with Findlay. The jury deliberated for only two and a half hours. They returned their verdict, guilty as charged. To the surprise and shock of many, including David Smith, they spared Susan Smith the death penalty, sentencing her to 30 years to life in prison. She has the chance to convince a parole board in 2024 when she is 53 years old. David has promised that he will attend every single parole hearing as long as he has breath in his lungs to try and keep the murderer of his beloved children, Michael and Alexander, behind bars for the rest of her life. Michael and Alex were buried together in a white coffin. To this day, the community of Union and everyone who was involved in this horrific case asks why. How could she do this? And why did she do this? I believe there is a simple answer. Smith wanted to shed herself of her children so that she might resume the relationship with Tom Findlay. Susan Smith committed the most unthinkable act when she broke humanity's most sacred trust, the love of a mother for her children.